friends. Um, good morning and welcome to the Collaborative on Health and the Environment Alaska Teleconference on Toxic Chemicals in Everyday Products, Health Effects of Toxic Flame Retardants, or PBDEs, and State Policies to Prevent Exposures. And today we have um, guest presenters Dr. Ami Zota, Kathleen A. Curtis, and Samantha Englishu. My name is Diana DeFazio, and on behalf of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, I'll be facilitating today's call. And today Alaska is a regional partnership group of the National Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che Alaska aims to advance knowledge and effective action to address growing concerns about the links between human health and environmental factors. And you can find more information on the following websites, www.akaction.org and www.healthandenvironment.org. The call will last one hour, and all participants are muted during the presentations, and then we'll open the lines up for the last five to ten minutes of the call for questions. And before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to say a little about why we are having this call today. PBDEs, or polybrominated diphenyl ethers, are a class of flame retardant chemicals that can be found in home electronics, foam furniture, and other household items. PBDEs can migrate out of products and later wind up in the air we breathe and the foods we eat. And they persist in the environment and bioaccumulate in the fatty tissues of wildlife and humans. There's mounting scientific evidence linking, expo linking exposure to PBDEs to a range of adverse health effects. And Dr. Ami Zota of University of California, San Francisco's Program on Reproductive Health and Environment will be telling us more about how we are exposed and what is known and suspected about the human health effects of PBDE's exposure. PBDE's are largely unregulated in the U.S., and increasingly people are looking to state policies to prevent exposures and protect public health. And Kathy Curtis, Executive Director of Clean and Healthy New York, will talk about where we are today with chemicals policy and discuss the laws that other states have passed and how they did it. And later in the call, Samantha Englishu of Alaska Community Action on Toxics will talk about proposed Alaska legislation, HB 63 and SB 27, which would ban PBDEs, and what we can do with limited time left in the session to make sure we can move this important public health measure forward. So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. We're honored to be joined today by Dr. Ami Zota. Ami is a postdoctoral fellow at UC San Francisco's Program on Reproductive Health and Environment. She uses her expertise in epidemiology, exposure assessment, and environmental justice to investigate the cumulative impacts of environmental and social factors on reproductive health. Her current work focuses on effects of environmental chemicals exposure on thyroid function, cardiovascular function, and birth outcomes in an ethnically and socioeconomically diverse population of pregnant women. Dr. Zoda completed her master's and doctorate in environmental health at the Harvard School of Public Health in 2007. And Ami comes to the program from the Silent Spring Institute, a nonprofit research in institute where she conducted policy-oriented research on women's health and the environment. She is currently an Environmental Health Science Communications Fellow. Welcome, Ami. Would you like to begin? Um, hello, yes. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for the invitation. And I have been working on exposures to and health effects of polybrominated uh, flame retardants now for about five years. Um, I'm going to focus um, my talk today on PBDEs. And then what I figured is if, if we have a little bit of extra time at the end, I can talk about some of the substitute flame retardants, but I'll leave that to the end to make sure that everyone has um, time to talk. So uh, let me begin by um, talking to you about a little bit about just giving a general background on PBDEs. These are polybro polybrominated diphenyl ethers. Um, they are organo they're persistent organic compounds. Um, commonly used in polyurethane foam and furniture, car seats, electronics, and carpet padding. Um, as Diana mentioned, they're not chemically bound to the product, so they can easily migrate out of the product. There's 209 different congeners, and they essentially vary by where the bromine um, is, is attached and how many bromines are attached. Um, they've been used widespread in consumer products since the 1970s. There's three major commercial formula formulations, Penta, which is commonly used in polyurethane foam, Octa, um, which is used less in um, 
consume our products that we're exposed to every day, and DECA, um, which is used mostly in electronics. And um, Penta and Okta are are currently or have been uh, are being more actively phased out while DECA is still in use. Um, and because we still have many of the existing laws, um, such as what we have in California, even though, for example, in California, um, Penta and Okta has been banned by the state of California, um, but because we still have the flammability standards, um, PBDEs are being replaced by other brominated and um, chlorinated products. Um, they are extremely persistent, um, and they bioaccumulate up the food chain, um, so they can stick around in our bodies for months to decades, um, and they can travel long distances. And what this means is not only do we find them in our consumer products in our homes, but we've essentially, scientists have doc documented the presence of PBDEs in virtually every matrix sampled, including polar bears, Tasmanian devils, um, marine wildlife, domestic cats, um, you know, breast milk, amniotic fluid, human blood. Um, and they're also now found ubiquitously in our food supply, especially foods um, high in animal fat. The general population is exposed through two major pathways. Um, the primary exposure route is dust. So these products um, are essentially sprayed onto things like polyurethane foam, and then they can migrate out of the foam and um, end up in our indoor air and dust. And essentially, we become exposed, you know, partly through the pig pen effect because we're essentially walking around in our own little personal cloud of dust. Um, the other way that we're exposed is through the through our diet and the food chain. And uh, what we've seen um, with other persistent organic compounds like PCBs and DDT, um, that even once these chemicals are banned, uh, uh, humans will continue to be exposed for a long time. One, because products with PBDEs um, are slow to be replaced. You know, a couch has an average lifespan of about 10 years in each home, and you know, most couches end up in two or three homes. Um, and the other thing is, even after the indoor exposures uh, decrease, we'll still be exposed to the food supply. Um, so that's a little bit of background. Now I want to talk. Uh, a bit about why we care about this. For one thing, um, PBDEs, PBD exposures are widespread. So we looked at exposures to a range of endocrine disrupting chemicals among U.S. pregnant women using the NHANES, uh, the CDC NHANES um, uh, data set, and we found that 100% of U.S. pregnant women have PBDEs in their bodies. Um, we're concerned about the health effects of PBDEs because um, they are structurally similar to thyroid hormones, and thyroid hormones play a critical role in uh, fetal brain development. They also play a critical role in um, energy metabolism, our cardiovascular system, as well as our ability to um, reproduce successfully. So thyroid hormones play a critical role in many different of our basic life functions, and you know, these PBDEs are hormonally active um, and are thyroid toxicants. Um, anim there's been a wealth of animal studies studying the um, harmful effects of PBDs. Uh, they have been shown to disrupt the inner endocrine system, interfere with thyroid hormone signaling. Um, they are neurotoxicants and um, can affect the developing brain. Um, they can affect reproductive endpoints, immunosuppression, and potentially act um, as carcinogens or mutagens. Um, this research has shown that there are, um, that not all people will bear the same risk to uh, PBDE exposures and that there are windows of susceptibility. Uh, for example, the prenatal period particularly is a window of increased susceptibility. Um, so our own work, which has um, I'm currently looking at exposures to and health effects of PBDEs in pregnant women here in California. We found that PBDEs and their hydroxylated metabolites were correlated with higher levels of thyroid stimulating um, hormone, which, um, is, which is characteristic of hypothyroidism. 
Other effects of PBDEs on early development. So PBDEs disturb development of the fetal human brain cells. Um, in animal studies, neonatal and postnatal PBD exposures affect learning, memory, and attention. And um, we now have several epidemiologic studies that also um, uh, support the findings of animal studies. So for example, a study done by Herb Semen et al. Um, from Columbia University in 2010 found that children with higher prenatal exposures to PBDEs 47, 99, and 100, which are characteristic of the, of the PENTA formulation, scored lower on tests of mental and physical development, including uh, lower I including lower IQs. And it's in important to note that the prenatal exposures that um, they found in this New York cohort were actually lower than the um, US national average and um, much, much lower than levels found in states such as California. Other important effects that have been found, uh, particularly from uh, prenatal exposures to PBDEs in humans, is uh, reproductive effects. So the Chamacos cohort, um, that Dr. Brenda Eskenazi runs out of UC Berkeley, they found that PBD exposure was associated with increased time to pregnancy in California women. And um, this same cohort found an association between prenatal PBDE exposure and low birth weight. And the effects on low birth weight were actually quite high, so they found that each tenfold increase in concentrations of BDE 47, 99, and 100 were associated with an approximately 115 gram decrease in birth weight. And um, they, they stated in the paper, actually, that these effects were, you know, of the magnitude that, of what people have found with um, smoking during pregnancy and its impacts on uh, birth weight. So these are not um, small effects that can easily be discounted particularly since, um, you know, exposures are widespread. Um, so now I want to talk a, part, a bit about the unique situation in California, which um, is what I've spent a lot of my time working on. And um, California, California Technical Bulletin 117, so this is a 1975 uh, standard. It's a performance-based standard. So it says that foam in furniture must be able to withstand an open flame for 12 seconds. It does not say how manufacturers have to comply with the standard, but the cheapest, historically, the cheapest way to comply with the standard is to add um, halogenated flame retardants, uh, especially Penta BDE, to the furniture. It's a unique standard, and no other state has a parallel standard. Uh, and, you know, um, certain people have estimated that historically around over 97% of the global use of Penta BDE in North America was used to meet Technical Bulletin 117. And this is partly because, you know, California has such a large market and also many manufacturers um, essentially use te Technical Bulletin 117 as the de facto standard for all the furniture they sell um, across the country. For example, IKEA makes uh, one set of furniture for the European market and one set of furniture for the American market. And the furniture they make for the American market across the US is in compliance with Technical Bulletin 117. And what we found um, when I was at Silent Spring Institute, we did a, um, a large exposure assessment study in homes in Richmond, which is a community near the Chevron oil refinery, a lower income, ethnically diverse community. And we also sampled the indoor air and house dust of homes in Bolinas, which is a remote community near the ocean of you know, environmentally conscious people. And what we found was we found elevated levels of PBDEs in house dust of both of these communities. And this was a surprise finding, and this is actually how I've kind of ended up studying flame retardants for so long. Um, we found that the, the median levels of California PBDE dust levels in these homes were four to 10 times higher than other North American regions. And they were 200 times higher than what, we were, what people were finding in the homes of um, European countries. 
so then we went and said, well, if you know, if people say that the major exposure route is dust, and we're finding these high levels of uh, penta PBDEs in the house dust of California homes, then Californians themselves must have um, elevated levels in their bodies. And uh, so we did an analysis with N. Haynes, and we were able to get geographic data um, and separate the people in California from the rest of the U.S. Um, and we found that Californians, after accounting for differences in age and gender and household income, um, had twice the levels of PBDEs um, in their bodies compared to the rest of the U.S. Um, so then I became interested in specifically looking at a, um, ex health effects of PBDEs um, you know, in Californians. And uh, some of our recent work, which was just published last year, we looked at PBDE exposures um, in a group of US-born um, pregnant women. These women are largely on public health insurance. And um, they're quite ethnically diverse. And uh, what we found was that these, even, and these women were sampled in uh, 2008 and 2009. And uh, interestingly, right, this is, this is now about three to four years after PBDEs have been banned in California. And uh, we found that still these women um, from San Francisco General Hospital had the highest levels of PBDEs uh, among pregnant women worldwide. Um, these levels were uh, about twice as high as the NHANES average and three to seven times higher than um, what has been documented in the Chamaco study, which lar their cohort is largely, it's in California, but it's mostly uh, lower income Mexican immigrant uh, women from the farm working community. And so this also points to, you know, the ability of PBDEs to remain in the body because their exposures, the Mexican immigrant women's exposures are still being influenced by what their childhood exposures were um, when they were back in Mexico, which was lower than what you see in the U.S. So that has been an interesting thing to uh, understand that there's such a big difference between our cohort and the Chamacos cohort, even though they're um, both from uh, California. And, uh, and we did see preliminary associations with thyroid hormone um, function. Um, another vulnerable group that is uh, very sad to think about, so I've already talked about how um, PBDEs can affect the, have the ability to disrupt the development um, to disrupt childhood development and the way the brain develops, um, both during the prenatal period and the early postnatal period. Um, well, we found that children are another vulnerable population. So they, we have seen that uh, children have, so particularly children in California, so a study from uh, Irva Hertz Picciotta's group at UC Davis, they found that PBDE levels in California children aged two to five years old are similar to levels in occupationally exposed adults. So if, you know, the average level of BDE 47 in pregnant women in California is, let's say, around 40, um, for kids, it's between 70 and 80 nanograms per gram lipid. So, um, you know, that's just extremely alarming. And to me alone, you know, that just warrants concern and policy action. Um, and the reason why there may be these elevated levels is, one, you know, kids are on the ground, they're crawling around, there's frequent hand-to-mouth behavior, and there is also increased exposure via breastfeeding. And the breastfeeding route, um, you know, the role of breast milk in contributing to these elevated exposures, you know, that still definitely needs to be teased out. We obviously know there are high levels of these um, fat-loving compounds like PBDEs in breast milk, but it's still unclear um, how much of a child's exposures um, during these early toddler years is influenced by the prenatal environment versus the postnatal environment. Um, one last vulnerable population that um, 
that I, some of my work has really brought attention to is uh, lower income communities and people of color. Um, this is a bit non-intuitive because you would think, okay, these are coming from the indoor environment, they're coming from consumer products, so why, you know, why would this be an EJ issue? Um, but now there's been uh, several studies both within California and outside of California that have found um, higher PBDE body burdens in lower income populations as well as higher levels in black adolescent girls compared to white and Hispanic counterparts. And, um, and we have seen both my own work as, and um, the Chamaco's work have found that the highest PBDE dust levels in the world come from lower income California homes in Richmond, Salinas, and Oakland. Um, so the reasons for this uh, racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities in PBDEs is not well understood. But um, some theories include that um, the age and type of furniture, so we know from these kind of more um, laboratory-oriented control studies that the longer, um, the more aged furniture is and the more that the foam breaks down, um, the more available the PBDEs become to the air and the dust. Also, housing conditions such as ventilation um, could play a role in um, dilution. And we know that um, often lower income homes have poorer ventilation, so there may be less opportunities for dilution. And, um, and then um, and, uh, there could also be a role for other housing factors. And then cheaper furniture could just be made differently. Um, there may be less uh, barriers uh, between the foam and, you know, there may be, like, there may be less barriers on the foam. And um, there just may be more chemicals um, used in the foam. Um, so I just want to end by just kind of talking a little bit about kind of the context of fire safety and um, the whole reason that people think we need these chemicals. Uh, so, you know, people, they were originally added to furniture um, for public health reasons as a way to um, address the problem of people being injured and dying from um, house fires. And um, I just want to say that in general, um, fire-related morbidity and mortality has gone down in the U.S. over the last 25 years, but the, the, the drop, the, the, you know, the, the decrease in California is no different than the rest of the U.S. The main reason, the main reasons contributing to this decrease in fire-related morbidity and mortality is, you know, largely people have stopped smoking as much, um, there's been improvements in building code, and there's also been the introduction of fire-safe cigarettes so that if no one is actively smoking the cigarette, it will go out over time. Um, you know, there are other costs um, associated with using Penta BDEs. So if there is a fire, uh, there's increased amount of smoke, carbon monoxide, and soot. And these are actually the things that end up killing people from fires. And um, some work by uh, fire engineers have showed that adding these flame retardants gives you three seconds. So that's essentially what it gives you from, um, you know, the time to, from the time uh, a fire, like from time of ignition to a time of fire shuts. It gives you three seconds. But it also gives you a lot more smoke, carbon monoxide, and soot. Um, and, um, you know, the last thing is, you know, all of the science has also spurred um, consensus and action from scientists. So. Scientists from the world are concerned about the toxicity of halogenated flame retardants. And um, the San Antonio Statement, um, which was published in 2010, um, it was signed by more than 210 scientists and physicians um, from 30 countries um, voicing their concern about the toxicity and use of halogenated flame retardants. This was published in Environmental Health Perspectives. So I just want to conclude um, with just some really basic points. Um, PBDEs are ubiquitous and exposures will persist for decades to come. Adverse effects on the thyroid system and the developing brain have been observed at exposure levels found in the general U.S. population. Exposures in California residents, particularly children, remain elevated compared to the rest of the U.S. and the world. And the situation, um, you know, in certain states like California warrants concern and policy change is needed so we don't repeat these mistakes with other chemical flame retardants. And, um, you know, uh, 
uh, we do also a lot of work in reporting results back to participants and um, thinking about how personal exposure, like where are there opportunities for individual and collective action. And you know, certain contaminants um, like it, pesticides, there is a role for individual action. Um, whereas for flame retardants, because of their ubiquitous use, essentially the only way we can reduce exposure is through the policy arena. Uh, so with that, um, I'll end there. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ami, um, for your research and contribution to understanding the health effects and also the unique vulnerabilities of different populations and the need for policy, which is a perfect segue um, to my introduction of Kathleen A. Curtis. And Kathy Curtis is Executive Director of Clean and Healthy New York. She has more than two decades' experience in New York's environmental health movement and is a widely recognized national leader. She is on the Safer Chemicals Healthy Family Steering Committee, participates in the business NGO work group for Safer Chemicals and Sustainable Materials, and is on the steering committee for the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, where she coordinates their policy and advocacy work group. Kathy co-coordinates the Just Green Partnership, is the coordinator of the Hazardous Flame Retardant Campaign, and is a longtime leader of the Coming Clean Collaborative Work Group. And Kathy, um, we're very honored to have you today to share your experiences working for state policies. So you can go ahead and begin. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, so you might, you know, uh, logically question, how did we get into this mess? And it's because of the way that chemicals are regulated or not regulated, under-regulated in the United States. Uh, of the 100% of chemicals that gets produced every year, only about 5% of them actually leave facilities in smokestacks into the air or in pipes into the river or away on trucks in land-based dumps. And that's what's accounted by TRI data, toxic release inventory data. This, this is the permitted pollution that you apply for permits and they, you know, you have to report your releases and that kind of thing. So that's sort of the waste end. About 95% of the toxic chemicals that leave facilities leave them in products, in personal care products, electronics, furniture, household cleaners, toys, child care products, you name it. And this is the largely unregulated segment of toxic chemical uh, distribution, if you will. And the chemical, the, the policy that's supposed to manage that is the Toxic Substances Control Act of 1976. Uh, when this law passed, the 62,000 chemicals that were already in commerce, many of which should never have been approved for use to begin with, were simply grandfathered in and assumed safe at that point. And now we're up to about 83,000 chemicals. Uh, of those chemicals, the EPA only has reasonable safety data, adequate safety data for about 200 of them. Only five chemicals have been banned under TSCA, and none have been banned since 1990. And that's because there is such an onerous burden of proof that the EPA has to amass in order to attempt to ban a chemical that they've just basically given up. They tried to uh, uh, ban asbestos back in 1990 and were taken to court and they lost, even though they had whole entire rooms full of testing about the dangers of asbestos. So uh, under TSCA, no pre-market testing is required to, re to release a chemical onto the market. Uh, they get to hide behind confidential business information and trade secrets, and therefore very little information is available on those chemicals. There's no labeling requirements of them, so you could buy, uh, uh, let's say, a nursing pillow, and it, even though the polyurethane foam contains about 5 or 6 percent of a flame retardant chemical, it's not required to list it on the label. And uh, this has created a lot of regrettable substitution. Uh, in other words, people just switch out one toxic chemical for another because they're so inadequately regulated. Uh, under and you know laws that pass tend to be chemical by chemical and not systemic. So uh, back in 2004, the EPA arrived at a production phase out agreement for Penta and Oxy BDA, and uh, therefore those chemicals are no longer made in the United States. 
However, they do come back over the border from China and elsewhere in products, and therefore we are still continually exposed. Uh, since then, 12 states have codified the ban on Penta and Octa BDE in products. And uh, there are numerous loopholes in those state laws, such as they uh, contain de minimis levels of up to 1,000 parts per million that products can still contain. And many of the states also have recycling exemptions so that that foam can be recycled and come back in our carpet padding and you know, into our homes um, for you know, decades to come. Now, six states also banned DECA BDE, the third and most widely used of the PBDEs. That's Hawaii, Maryland, Maine, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington. And since then, the EPA entered into another production phase-out agreement with the makers of PBDs to phase out DECA. And, uh, but again, it can still come over the border into our nation through products. Now, uh, what's happened since then is that product makers sort of did an end run around this legislative intent to ban PBDs by replacing them with uh, chlorinated tris, the two, brand, the two types of tris, TCEP and TDCPP, and also proprietary blends of chemicals like V6 or Firemaster 550, or Green Armor, Emerald 1000, those are the new uh, breeds of flame retardant uh, blends that we don't get to know what they consist of and some scientist has to take them apart in a laboratory to find out what they're really made of and uh, thus far they're still made of halogenated chemicals chlorinated or brominated flame retardants or some combination thereof uh, pr recent product testing both by Heather Stapleton at Duke University and also uh, av an advocacy product testing report by the Washington Toxics Coalition shows that TRIS, the TDCPP chemical, is the biggest replacement chemical for Penta in foam, in particularly child care products. So high chairs, car seats, strollers, nursing pillows, changing pads, anything that has polyurethane foam. And uh, so, you know, clearly there's still need for protective legislation. And New York State passed the first TCEP ban in the nation, and TDCPP has, uh, has been banned by the New York State Assembly, and that's pending in the New York State Senate, which also New York was the first state to pass fire-safe cigarettes legislation, which the bromine industry opposed uh, and fought. So, and several states now are working to pass bans of both of the TRIS chemicals, TCEP and TDCPP, uh, Washington State, Connecticut, Maryland, and New York, for example. So, but, you know, it's still important for states like Alaska to slam the door on uh, PBDs and get it out of imported products. And um, it w advocates are also advocating, in addition to state legislation, for market reform to avoid further regrettable substitution, which you know, they could do this forever. With 83,000 chemicals in commerce, and just a whole ton of them are either fluorinated, chlorinated, or brominated, which are the halogenated chemicals. They could keep just moving the molecule a little bit, and instead of uh, decabromodiphenyl ether, we would end up with decabromodiphenyl ethane, chemical uh, about which less is known and which is, you know, not subject to any... Uh, a phase-out agreement or state policy. So they, they could do this till the cows come home. So uh, that's why it's important to do market reform and approach product makers to avoid further regrettable substitution. Uh, and the three things we're asking of product makers is to redesign products to avoid toxic chemicals. One of the bi biggest problems, as Ani noted, is the use of polyurethane foam. It's very flammable. It's made. It's a petroleum-based material, so you ha almost have to add chemicals if you're going to expose bare foam to an open flame for 12 seconds and expect it to not burn. And it's weird because one of the reasons there's no fire safety benefit from this is because most products that are in use, the vast majority of them, are covered with fabric. 
So by the time the fabric ignites, it's going to burn for more than 12 seconds anyway. And therefore, the foam is going to burn. And that's why you only get three seconds additional protection from uh, adding these chemicals. So we're asking folks to redesign products. For example, polyethylene, um, the uh, sort of fiber, uh, like blown in, uh, in into padded products instead of already shaped and formed into a shape, it just melts. It won't really ignite. And uh, so that's a much better uh, stuffing material and much more inherently flame retardant. Uh, so we're asking folks to redesign products. But if they must use them, to use the least toxic and to at least label them accordingly so that people can make informed choices when they're buying products. And you know, uh, companies can favorably differentiate themselves from those who, use, who add toxic chemicals. And we're also asking them to be a little more thoughtful about and disclose the material selection criteria. In other words, every time a uh, flame retardant gets banned, do they just turn around to their suppliers and say, OK, what else have you got? that's not banned, thereby putting their brand, their workers, their shareholders, and all the rest of us at risk of further damage? Or they, do they do a hazard and alternatives assessment in order to not have to repeat this process three years from now when we find out their replacement chemical is equally harmful? Uh, so those are the efforts. And who supports those efforts? Well, firefighters, nurses, other healthcare workers, health affected groups like breast cancer advocates, learning disabilities advocates, uh, EJ leaders, sustainable businesses, teachers, workers, environmental conservation groups, and the list goes on and on. Who opposes? Well, there's an AstroTurf group called Citizens for Fire Safety. That was a creation of the three main flame retardant chemical makers, Albemarle, Chemtura, and Israeli Chemicals Limited. And they pass themselves off as some grassroots group of people that were sitting around their living room going, geez, I'm really worried that they're taking flame retardant chemicals out of products, and we have to band together and fight those efforts. And uh, they've spent a lot of money to especially maintain the California unique, onerous TB117 flammability standard, because as Ani noted, uh, products are made nationally to meet that standard. And product makers do tend to uh, match the most stringent standard and not have different uh, production lines or different locations, which is another reason why state legislation is important, because it drives them nuts and it helps to drive to a national standard. So they, uh, Citizens for Fire Safety, as if you know, the rest of us are against fire safety, and they're the ones that are for fire safety. Uh, hired lobbyists in all of the states that are working on bans, bans, and they employ very dirty tactics. Uh, they've d driven, d done their best to use race baiting and, and driv drive a wedge between uh, organizations and communities of color and the rest of us, sort of painting uh, environmental health advocates as, oh, they only care about peregrine falcons and bald eagles, and they don't care about, you know. Uh, the needs of the uh, EJ com the, uh, communities of color. So, and, and you know, it's a sort of a question of whoever gets to folks first. If they get out there in front with their message, you know, they do tend to get support from uh, groups that have been, you know, discriminated against on other fronts and therefore are more than ready to accept that they're being discriminated on this front as well. So then we have a lot of work to do to sort of swim up that waterfall to uh, convince folks that you know they're being duped and, and used. And uh, also the burn community and firefighters are the three big targets so, uh, of Citizens for Fire Safety. So they have uh, retired burn doctors, one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast, to attend public hearings and you know, uh, you know, put forth the tragedy of people burning in fires. And they have uh, reti some retired you know, fire marshal or you know, a couple of firefighters that they trot out and uh, go around to uh, testify as well to say, you know, that these, this is a proven safe technology and, you know, uh, it's life-saving, you know, and, not, and we, there's no science to support that it's toxic, which, of course, is ridiculous. And uh, so that's what we're up against. 
They're, they spent $9 million in one quarter in California alone. So who can, you know, who can match that? Not, we, none of us can match that. And uh, they get to say whatever lies or whacked nonsense, you know, they want, and we have to be unassailable and bulletproof in our uh, messaging and our science and our materials. So it's certainly, uh, they have the unfair advantage, and the one benefit that we have is we're right. And, uh, you know, the very broad and diverse uh, support for toxic-free fire safety. So there's a lot more information about this at uh, www toxicfreefiresafety.org and uh, for, certainly feel free to contact me as well for further information. And thank you so much for having me and allowing me to hold forth on one of my favorite subjects. Thank you, Kathy. We're really happy to have you and thanks for reviewing the policy need and the real big policy challenges for us. And um, we'll add that link to our website, our web page as well for the call. So thanks again. Um, finally, I'd like to introduce Samantha Englishu, Environmental Health and Justice Organizer for Alaska Community Action on Toxics. And Samantha is Gwich'in Athabaskan, Kaguantan Tlingit, and a lifelong Anchorage resident. She graduated from Seattle University, where she majored in political science and pre-law. And after graduation, she worked as a public policy fellow in the office of Representative Beth Kurtula and as a rural Affair affairs intern for Senator Mark Begich. Um, and she's been working hard on the Alaska legislation that she will be discussing. So welcome, Samantha. Great. Thank you, Diana. And thanks again, Ami and Kathy. Um, ACAT is hosting this call because we consider the rapidly rising levels of these brominated flame retardants in Alaska to be a public health concern. And to the rural communities that ACAT serves, exposure is certainly considered an important, an important Arctic health issue for both human and wildlife populations. We feel we're at a point where we've had these chemicals in our homes for over three decades. There's plenty of science showing these chemicals are hazardous, and other states have successfully implemented safer chemical and non-chemical substitutes. We think this type of chemical safety reform is inevitable, but it can take decades for levels in the environment and people to decrease, making it even more important that they're phased out of commerce quickly. For those reasons and more, um, state legislation was introduced last year in the first half of the 27th Alaska Legislature. Companion bills, House Bill 63, sponsored by Representative Lindsey Holmes, and Senate Bill 27, sponsored by Senator Bill Wilkowski, would phase out the manufacture, sale, and distribution of products containing Penta, Octa, and Deca BDE. This legislation would prevent products containing these toxic chemical flame retardants from coming into Alaska. As Kathy said, the EPA is addressing the U.S. manufacture of these chemicals while states are addressing the import of these chemicals in products and articles. Both bills were carried over from last year into the second regular session, which we're approaching in the last few weeks of. Um, I'd like to do a quick overview of the legislation and give an update on the committee action so far th this session, and um, as well as mention new and renewed support for the bills. I'll finish with a call for action for those interested in becoming engaged on this toxic issue. The current versions of Senate Bill 27 and House Bill 63 would phase out the manufacture and sale of electronic products, furniture, textiles, and mattresses containing all three commercial forms of PBDEs by 2013 and 2014, respectively. Both versions have an immediate effective date for the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation to participate in a multi-state chemicals clearinghouse in order to build capacity to identify and promote safer chemicals and products and to enhance the efficiency of state initiatives on chemicals through collaboration and co coordination. Alaska would be sharing resources and building knowledge with other states and um, you know, states that have been in the lead, like New York. The initial enforcement will be on manufacturers to provide product information, and it's the intent to publicize the ban to signal the marketplace and to educate companies and consumers on purchasing PBDE-free products and for the department to conduct occasional spot checks on products to ensure manufacturers are in, in compliance. Um, at the end of last year's session, the bills made it further in the legislature than ever before, um, you know, but this session, Senate Bill 27 has passed some key hurdles, but currently House Bill 63 is stalled. So last year's Senate Bill had um, 27 had two hearings in the Health and um, Social Services Committee, and a committee substitute for the bill was introduced and passed out. It had um, a hearing at the end of the session in 
um, the Finance Committee and was held over to this year. House Bill 63 had two hearings in House Labor and Commerce and then was held over. You know, although we have a new majority caucus member that's joined as a co-sponsor and there's been increased efforts to lay the groundwork with legislative offices, House Bill 63 has yet to be scheduled another hearing in the House Labor and Commerce Committee. But if it's passed out of this committee, its next referral would be the House Finance Committee. Um, there's some good news. On February 24th, Senate Bill 27 passed out of the Senate Finance Committee without any problem. The next step is um, for the full Senate to pass the legislation before sending it to the House. And you know, our state legislation continues to receive support. Last October, the Alaska Federation of Natives, um, this is the largest representative annual gathering in the U.S. of Native people of Native peoples um, with the membership that includes 178 villages voted in support of a resolution that calls for the phase out of chemicals such as PBDEs in order to protect the health and well-being of future generations. Several tribes before AFN passed this reg resolution had already signed letters of support due to the profound impacts PBDEs are having in the Arctic. Their chemical properties allow them to concentrate in cold climates and they're toxic and they just bioaccumulate in northern food webs. In Alaska, PBDEs have been detected in humans, seabird eggs, marine mammals, otters, polar bears, and in air samples. You know, and you have to think about um, the people that live here where the environment um, and your life aren't separate. So compared with, um, for example, orcas and whale populations in Europe, Greenland, and Canada, Alaska offshore orcas um, had by far the highest total concentrations of PBDEs. And it's also very concerning that the highest known concentration of PBDEs in human populations in the Arctic were found in um, Yupik women of childbearing age in the Yukon Kuskokum Delta of Alaska. So for all these reasons, um, you know, that's why we're hosting this call. And so for the participants today, we would encourage you to pass along the information presented today as part of a personal message to your district senator and representative. We're expecting some movement soon, um, at least for Senate Bill 27, so it's timely right now to communicate a request for common sense, safe consumer products in our homes and a healthier environment for your families and fellow residents of our state. And although there's a need to influence the House Labor and Commerce Committee and the Senate body, every legislator needs to hear from Alaskans and constituents who care about a non-toxic future and positive, healthy outcomes. And you know, on our but, um, on the ACAT website, akaction.org, there's more information about these two bills, House Bill 63 and Senate Bill 27, as well as fact sheets about this toxic chemicals. And you know, I know personally, I'd be happy to follow up with anyone if you had questions for myself or our presenters, and or if you need help to find who your legislators are and their contact information. And you can also sign up on our website to receive action, action alerts, and those would provide contact information and talking points as well. So thank you again for taking time to learn about this important toxic exposure legislation. And I'm going to turn the call over to Diana. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'd like to thank all of our presenters for sharing their expertise and taking the time to be with us today and for you know, presenting the, the latest science, the latest policy efforts, and for you know, highlighting why we in Alaska should be particularly concerned about PBDEs. And now is your opportunity to um, ask questions of our speakers. And so I'd like to open the lines for questions and comments. And please wait a moment while we unmute the lines. Just a moment. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please press star six on your telephone to unmute your line and please state your name and affiliation. We also ask that you please try to be brief with your comments to allow others the opportunity to speak as well. This is Alice Chostick, and I'm just a concerned citizen. Um, my question would be probably directed um, perhaps to Kathy, and that would be um, because of the misinformation and trying to um, uh, mislead perhaps the public, if they are going to be labeling products, um, is there something that we can look at to uh, identify the substances and know that what's in a product, it really is um, something that 
would be less damaging to the environment? Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, right now, there are no labeling requirements. It would be completely voluntary for them to do so. And the type of labeling that we've seen or information on product websites is more along the lines of, we are PBDE free, which that's great, but it doesn't mean that they're not using some other equally toxic replacement chemical. Or they'll say, um, we comply, or we have a, a Ecotex, or one of the green certifications, um, some of which are better than other, others, and none of which uh, certify that a product is not toxic, that c contains no toxic chemicals whatsoever. So the best way right now is to become part, to join the, join the, um, join the party, if you will, and whenever you want to buy a product, especially if it has a label that says it complies with the TB117 uh, flammability standard, is to call the company, contact them directly, and ask them how they achieve that flammability standard and whether or not they add toxic chemicals in order to achieve the standard. Can I, can I add something? This is Ami. Um, just, just to echo what was said, I mean, one thing, almost seeing the TB1117 label, which many pieces of furniture actually will have, I mean, they're required to have that label that says, you know, this, this piece of furniture is, hold on, I can even have a picture of it on my, well, basically says that this piece of furniture is in compliance with TB117. I mean, if you see that label, that basically means most likely there are halogenated flame retardants um, in whatever product um, that label is on. Um, the second thing, this is, once again, more California-specific, but um, um, chlorinated tris was just added, which um, you know, is the, one of the big replacements for PBDEs in furniture, was just added to the Prop 65 list here in California. And if a chemical is on the Proposition 65 list, the, any, any product that has that chemical has to have a warning label on it that says, you know, this product contains a reproductive or developmental toxicant. Obviously, it's voluntary and it's, you know, the enforcement of it is not great, but, um, you know, consumer groups have actually um, waged successful lawsuits against manufacturers for not labeling, for not appropriately labeling um, products um, according to Proposition 65. So um, that was just added to the Prop 65 list in the last six months. And so here in California, which does have implications for other states, it'll be interesting to see if people begin labeling furniture that has chlorinated tryst with the appropriate labeling. Uh, hello, this is Fran Solomon from the Evergreen State College in Washington State. I have a question for Dr. Zoda. Could you briefly just talk about the impacts of PBDEs on the immune defense system? On the what? Immune system? On the, yeah, on the immune system, especially in Arctic human populations. You know, that's that's a really great question. Um, I, you know, in general, um, a lot of scientists think that these endocrine disruptors can affect the immune system. And um, and there's also, uh, you know, there is some, one potential way is also through the thyroid. Um, I mean, there is, the thyroid hormones play a role in immune system development as well, and that could potentially be one pathway. Um, but especially with respect to human populations, those associations are, you know, we're just not there with the science, honestly. Um, you know, a, a few endocrine disruptors, but not PBDEs per se, have, people have started looking at, for example, prenatal exposure to phthalates and asthma, and, you know, that's obviously immune system oriented effect. Um, but my, I don't know of any human studies, uh, much less studies in Alaska populations that have looked at, you know, flame retardants and immune system effects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello. Um, 
My name is Kim Lee Wong. I'm calling from Winnipeg in Canada, um, and I'm with the Aboriginal People's Television Network. I'd just like to thank uh, the organizers for the opportunity for this call and the presenters for all their work. Um, I have a couple questions. I guess one is um, if anybody knows whether um, we're getting into forest fire season here in Canada, um, when they are doing the over overflights and dumping kind of flame retardants on large areas of land, whether or not that's uh, PBDE, and also uh, looking uh, for any suggestions or ideas that people have around how to approach kind of the low income um, vulnerable population, as most people probably are aware. Um, people within, you know, environmental hazards are sometimes low down on the priority list um, for these groups and uh, wondering about how to, um, yeah, just approach that if anybody has any good ideas. And I just wanted to make a note that in Winnipeg, um, the firefighters did pressure the government to get some legislation change so that the firefighters are now compensated for certain cancers which have been linked to chemicals. Um, the firefighters fought that on, on, on that chemical basis. Unfortunately, it, it, it stayed very narrow, um, only to, to that, and it doesn't seem to have um, extended outside of, of that kind of a very particular <coughs> end issue. But well, this is Kathy. I, could, I, I believe that the spray foam, uh, you know, is made, is those, they're perfluorinated chemicals, is my understanding. And uh, so they're not PBDEs, but they're still halogenated chemicals. But they're definitely not okay. uh, non-toxic. And, and perfluorinated compounds are endocrine disruptors as well, and many of which that can actually affect some of the same um, endpoints as PBDEs can. Um, and just one more thing to add about, um, you know, your very great question about, you know, how to um, talk about these issues with, you know, traditionally environmental justice communities. I think that's, um, you know, something that we have to address if, you know, both in terms of finding reduction strategies but also kind of policy campaigns that will be effective. And I know here in California, as Kathy mentioned, you know, like Citizens for Fire Safety, in, in previous years when there was legislation in California, Citizens for Fire Safety actually approached lower income African American communities and actually paid them to come to court and say how any legislative reform would be racist because, you know, we are the people who are most affected by fire morbidity and mortality. Um, which is also true that lower income people are more at risk of fire-related health concerns. Um, I know here in California there are environment, you know, in more traditional environmental justice communities um, are coming together to, um, to essentially wage a long campaign um, outreach to these communities and um, discussing why why this legislation would be would you know would be beneficial to their communities too um, on just the terms of like practical advice um, you know that is a bit harder I mean there's always things just like dust control and cleaning and um, you know trying to avoid certain products um, you know one problem is is that interventions are not you, you know there's not a ton of data of what type of interventions work and I'm actually trying to get a study off the ground that would actually test different types of interventions in lower income homes to see what effect it would have on both dust levels of PBDEs as well as body burden levels of PBDEs so that we can provide more science-based um, recommendations on how to reduce chemicals. Thank you. And just, in terms of, just in terms of the firefighters and the presumptive disease laws, I just want to briefly say that that's a great way to partner with firefighters, is to help them advance these laws that uh, enable them to get benefits based on their extremely dangerous occupation and the illnesses that they, uh, you know, the cancers that are more specific to firefighters and other diseases. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Ami. Thank you, Samantha.
and thank you to all of the people that um, called in today. I, I imagine there are more questions out there, but we are just running out of time. So if, if you would like more information, want to get engaged in the Alaska legislation, um, or have questions that, that you didn't get to, you can email Samantha at akaction.org or me, Diana, at akaction.org. And um, before closing for today, I'd also like to remind everyone that we also have a CHE Alaska call next Monday, March 26th, with attorney and environmental justice leader Monique Hardin on um, the topic is upholding our human right to live in a healthy environment. So this is very much related to today's call, um, looking at justice and, and how these effects um, are distributed among people. If you, if you haven't already done so, you may RSVP for that call by emailing me at diana at akaction.org. And Monique will be in Alaska all of next week and will be giving presentations and workshops across the state. For more information about those events, you can visit our website, akaction.org, or call ACAT at 907-222-7714 for further information. Thank you again to everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and your interest. Thank you. Thanks.